Anderson from Mulan. Christy Page with Anderson from Mulan. Julie Weaver, Missoula Downtown Association. Tim France uh, with Wardens, but I'm here on behalf of the Business Improvement District. Kim Plagueis Johns, um, MDA board member, owner of JE Lane's Boutique. Jeff Badnock, I'll be making a presentation on the Riverfront Parking Feasibility Study. Teresa Cox with the Carousel for Missoula, and I'm on the Parking Commission. Rod Austin, I'm with Missoula Austria, and I'm on the Parking Commission. John Smith, I'm a local attorney, and I'm on the Parking Commission. I'm Carol Williams, Warden Payne, and I'm on the Parking Commission. Ellen Buchanan, Missoula Redevelopment Agency. Dave Olson, First Interstate Bank. Kevin Bray, CTA. And if any of you can't hear, there, there is noise. Would you, you know, wave your arms or something? We'll try to speak fully. Oh, yeah, more chairs. Great. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of guests. Is there any public comment? Raise your hand. Okay, we will move on with no announcements. Uh, do you have any announcements? Okay. <coughs> For those minutes, uh, I believe you all got your minutes online. Uh, did you go over them? Do you have any thoughts? I'm right up. I don't have any additions or corrections. I need accept them or approve them? Approve them. I'll second. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. We approve the minutes. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same. That passes. <coughs> Presentations. Paul, it's your show. Welcome, and we're first on the agenda and what is clearly the most exciting part of your meeting today. <laughs> <coughs> nice, I say tongue in cheek. We're here to present the audit report for the fiscal year ended June 13, 2007, which has been a while back. So when we refer to the year, it's going to be referring to June 30, 2007. Uh, with me is Christy, who you've, uh, I'm sure you've seen before, who, uh, who supervised and performed a good part of the audit uh, for the past couple of years, a couple of three years actually. She and I are going to kind of team tag the presentation today. You all should have an outline in front of you of our planned uh, remarks. <coughs> We're going to pretty much follow this and if any of you have questions as we go on, <coughs> you can either ask as, ask as you think of them or hold them till the end, whichever, whichever you'd like to do. Uh, just by way of introduction, thanks again to <coughs> Anne and at the time, Betty, who helped out with the audit and now, of course, Pete has, has stepped into her shoes uh, in the role for the Parking Commission, but we do appreciate <coughs> all the assistance and help that we get from staff in performing the audit. I think as Jim knows, you know, the, the, the role of auditors and auditees these days has become more and more, uh, there's a, more of a bright line between the two. At the same time, we still see the audit, the audit process as a collegial teamwork effort. It's not us versus you by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there was no change in the scope of the audit. This year, as compared to prior years, we have to follow the standards that are issued by the AICPA and also the standards issued by the GAO related to uh, government audits. Uh, the Parking Commission, as you know, is a component unit of the city, and that's why we, we follow those government auditing standards. Um, I'd like to have you turn to the audit report, which is the spiral-bound document that you all should have. Uh, the order of uh, presentation is the same as always. You see a table of contents. The information is presented in pretty much the same order as always. Um, our audit report appears on, uh, on page two, <coughs> and this goes on to page three as uh, what is called a clean or unqualified audit opinion. It's as good as it gets. We don't invent the language, but it basically says that your financial statements are fairly presented in accordance with the accounting rules that apply to, uh, to local government agencies such as yours. Um, beginning on page four is management discussion and analysis. If you haven't read this, this probably gives you as good of an of a overview of the uh, Parking Commission's performance for fiscal year 2007 as we certainly will provide. Um, Anne prepares this based on the financial information and, uh, and, and other matters that deal with the Parking Commission's uh, performance for fiscal year 2007. We're not going to talk about the MDNA, particularly, we're going to go to the financial statements, but I think 
our comments will be pretty much in line with what, what Anne has presented in the management's discussion. So if you want to flip to uh, page 7, it starts with the financial information with the balance sheet or statement of net assets. And I'm going to turn it over to Christy, who is going to give you just a 30,000 foot view of your financial results for 2007. Again, if you want to get into more details, we can sure do that for you. So, Christy, go ahead. 30,000 foot view. Um, mm -hmm. Parking Commission had a really quiet year in 2007. Um, the most significant change on the statement of net assets is investments increased by about $400,000, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the footnotes. Um, on the next page, the statement of revenues and expenses and changes. Um, there's some fluctuations in revenues and expenses. Revenues were down a little bit, but if you read the MDNA and comments on that, in that they had some unusual revenues in 2006, and that's why it might look a little odd. Expenses were up. I mean, that's true for everyone. Um, and interest income was up significantly, and that also is related to the investments. Um, on the next page, the statement of cash flows. Basically, the bottom line on this is, is that um, you have good cash flow. You had a small negative cash flow in 2007, but that was mostly related to some significant repairs and maintenance. They painted Central Park in 2007, um, things like that. If you turn to page 11, that's the start of the notes to the financial statements. Um, note one is, is the summary of all the significant accounting policies that the Parking Commission follows. There were no changes in 2007. Um, the next note to look at would be on page 14, cash and cash equivalents and investments. Um, something that was in the news quite a bit over uh, throughout the fall was, or mostly probably in November, December, was the issue with the short-term investment pool that the state manages. Um, the Parking Commission didn't have very much invested in STIP by the end of June because the city had determined to pull their money out of STIP and go with um, a different financial advisor and investment <coughs> manager. And because the, the city manages the Parking Commission's cash and investments, those m funds were pulled out as well. So if you see, they had, the Parking Commission had approximately <coughs> 900000 in 2006 and 85000 in 2007, and the city subsequently pulled substantially all of their investments out. And it's paid off, as you can see from the uh, interest earnings and the investment earnings. Uh, the uh, only other item of significance in the footnotes would be the uh, commitments on page 19. Um, we're talking about the Missoula downtown master plan today. And that's probably the most significant item in the audit report is the subsequent event. And then the non-financial of uh, Betty retiring and stepping into her shoes and taking over as administrator. That's all I have. <coughs> just, a, just a couple uh, additional points that I thought of as Christy was talking, and that is that in the cash flow statement, <coughs> it shows negative cash flows, but don't forget that Cash, cash flows is based solely on liquid cash, not investments, and so it's just your basic, you know, demand deposits that we're talking about here. So even if they go down, if you look at the balance sheet, investments are way up. So, so overall, in terms of, of uh, liquidity and cash, you're in, in really solid shape. Yes. The other thing about the STIP is that I think, in retrospect, the the, the press coverage of the SIV problems for the short-term investment pool was maybe somewhat overblown. Um, it turns out I don't know if the problem was really as bad as they thought because I think the level of investments in those questionable uh, vehicles wasn't, wasn't huge. Having said that, the city did a pretty good job of bailing out a stick before the, the issues right, occurred. Right, they had already, they had already yeah. started moving their investments the long before months, the so. issue came up in yeah. the news. <clears throat> right. So that was all I wanted to comment on. Um, <coughs> The, that's it for the financial statement highlights, pretty quick, but in summary, positive year, you know, things are going on pretty well. Some big events coming in the future, obviously, that are going to maybe put some strains on, on the Parking Commission in terms of projects and, and that kind of thing. Um, the, if you want to turn to page 20, 
This is our, <coughs> excuse me, our report on internal controls and compliance that's required by government auditing standards. And it deals, uh, as I mentioned, with two things. One's internal control, the other is compliance. And these are things that affect the, the Parking Commission's financial statements. Uh, since you don't have federal money, we don't have to do a uh, single audit or a, or a uh, federal audit under Circular A133. But the, the letter here, basically, there's two punchlines. One's on page 20, one's on page uh, 20, or excuse me, on both on page 21. And that is that there are no uh, significant deficiencies or non-compliance matters uh, as a result of our audit. So the report is as good as it gets, if you will, in terms of internal controls and compliance. Um, the, uh, the other report that we have, that's pretty much it on the main audit report, um, is the staple letter that you, you should have. The, the first heading is, is called Audit Committee Communications. And uh, as I have mentioned in prior presentations, this portion of the letter is required under auditing standards where organizations have an audit committee or the equivalent. And in, most, in a lot of cases, the full board will serve as the audit committee, if you will. And there are certain things that auditors are required to tell audit committees about. And of course, a lot of this comes out of the, you know, again, as I mentioned before, the, the need to have a stronger uh, bright line between auditors and auditees and to make sure that people understand <coughs> our responsibility as your auditors. Um, the, the form of this letter is, is not our creation, the standard language for these kind of communications. I'll use the term boilerplate because that's kind of what it is. We don't invent the, uh, don't invent the English here. Um, but I want to touch briefly on the items that are in this first part of the report. The first one has to do with our responsibility under auditing standards. Um, as I've said in prior presentations, the audit report that you just, we just walked through, it has our logo on it, we bind it up, all of that sort of thing. But management is responsible for the financial information. So the financial statements, the information <coughs> and the management discussion analysis is really ANS, ANS and management's responsibility. Uh, it's our job to give an opinion on the financial statements, which is what we have done as we've talked about in the report. The second item has to do with significant accounting policies. Um, Christy mentioned footnote one as basically being the, the manual, if you will, for how the financial statements are put together and presented. <coughs> if, uh, if the Parking Commission had any unusual accounting policies, the kind of things that you would not expect for Parking Commissions to be using, we would want to discuss those with you. And as in prior audits, there are no, no really unusual accounting policies uh, to talk about. Uh, the next page, accounting estimates. I always use the, the phrase accounting is not an exact science and people wonder about that, but many times financial statements in fact have estimates in them. A good example is depreciation. Some organizations such as, for example, uh, an insurance company has a really large estimate in terms of their estimate of losses on, on policies. In your case, there really aren't any unusual estimates. There is depreciation, which is an estimate of how you allocate the cost of assets over, over useful lives, and that's really the only one that's relevant to your financial statements. Um, audit adjustments, under the current rules, um, if we encounter significant audit adjustments, we need to report those to the board or to the audit committee, as the case may be, because oftentimes they can reflect the quality of the accounting records. Uh, so if, for example, if we find a lot of audit adjustments in the course of our work, that may indicate that the financial records maybe aren't in as good a shape as they should be. And help me, Christy, but I don't think we had <coughs> All we had any were reclassification entries because we were going off the city records to reclass for the report. Right. Which is So it's just a ma oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, a matter of taking JCCS information and kind of moving around a little bit in terms of the presentations and the external financial statements. <clears throat> uh, disagreements with management, um, if Ann or anyone else didn't like either the way we were doing our audit, what we chose to do or didn't choose to do, the way we were addressing financial statement information, um, we would report that to the board. Um, there were no such disagreements uh, that, uh, we encountered during the audit. Um, consultations with other independent accountants. Um, this is called opinion shopping. If you don't like our answer, go ask somebody else. Uh, none of that occurred. Um, Issues discussed prior to our retention as your auditors, we've been under a, uh, a contract for the audit and there certainly was nothing unusual about our being 
retained again for fiscal year 2007. Uh, and lastly, difficulties in in performing the audit. Um, the audit has gone smoothly for a long time. Great cooperation with all the people involved, and so certainly no, no difficulties from our perspective. The second part of this letter has to do with uh, our, our recommendations to management. <coughs> if we had encountered uh, significant internal control issues, they would have been in that other report that I just talked about before. But uh, so what we're talking about here is something that we think is it's worth telling you about, but it's not it's not a huge a huge issue. And the one comment that we have here has to do with waive tickets and uh, the way that waive tickets are uh, are accounted for, and uh, recommending that the implementing the software to its fullest capabilities to track to track wave tickets and reduce the possibility that some of them might, have, might not have been accounted for correctly. While we were performing field work at the beginning of October, Anne and I discussed this and she was in the process of implementing more of a review of wave tickets because the software tracks better who waved it, the reason documented for the wave. So she was working on implementing that process while we were there. So. This one will more than likely not be in next year. <coughs> Thank you. And that, in a very concise, hopefully in a quick uh, manner, was the summary of the audit report for 2007. If anybody has any questions about it or comments, we'd be glad to address them. I have a Short and sweet. Uh, in previous years, uh, Jim, I'm not sure if you don't want to get involved with there seems to have been a communication uh, challenge with matching, merging uh, our books with the city's books. Has that been solved? Are, are the communications working well now? Are you getting timely information from the city? Um, it, it is. Uh, it's gotten way better. We, we don't always get the... Um, you know, the cash information and the investment information on a monthly basis. Um, so sometimes, you know, if we don't get it for three or four months, we'll, you know, we'll just call them up and say, hey, we haven't received this in a while. Can you send it over? And that's why we have estimated incomes in there on, on your monthly financials until we true it up, which you'll see in the December and, and January financials where we, we true it up, and it's not usually that far off. But... Um, that's really, aside from that, the, the communication uh, is very good. It just it always isn't you know, quite as timely. But then the city doesn't get audited. And, I mean, they get audited at the same time. So, you know, they're pressed to get ready for their audit. It's a lot harder for the city to get ready than it is, you know, for you guys. There's just a lot involved there. So they, you know, fall behind a little bit in some of that other reporting that we would normally get. But it, I don't see it as being a, a big problem. We have a real good idea of, of you know where the investments are going to be and the level they're at so we just accrue them into the financials so the monthly financials that you are looking at from us uh, are, you know are, are very reasonable uh, with those estimates and then we chew them up when the, the city does get caught up in so it's gotten a lot way better still not quite there but I mean, Krista could comment if she wants to about the audit, but from our perspective, and you're right, because we're doing the city and the parking commission and MRA all pretty much at the same time, <coughs> we certainly haven't in, had any, any big issues in terms of uh, the way we're able to do the audit. So, no. Nope. Seems to be working okay. Any other questions? I've I, uh, seen an old finance guy, uh, and Rod, if you can chime in. You, we get our monthly statements, but this really is a statement you need to get a really strong cup of coffee and sit down and look at. We have a lot of challenges in the year, months and years to come. And having a, this kind of in the back of your mind is going to help a lot. So I encourage you all to, to really look at this report. It's an excellent report. So like you said, it is boilerplate stuff, but the comments on where we're at are important. Plus it also gives you a sense of... Uh, you know, things that are important and uh, going forward that will become more important than you're referring to. Yeah. I think the lack, the lack of comments is something you should be pleased with because, I mean, the more things you find in the back of that report, the more issues, you know, from an internal standpoint you have to face and there, 
there really aren't any. <laughs> you have some challenges with the things you're going to be doing. So these ho hum financials for the last couple of years are certainly going to change when <laughs> when some other things start cooking. So you know that. And is the wave ticket report? Have you is that mm -hmm. online? We have it, and just what Pete and I need to do is sit down and um, get him up to snap with it, and we develop a routine with it. We did somewhat scattered in the last couple of months, and I haven't been able to really bring him up to snap, but it will be reviewed routinely. So, but we, we have it all in place with our new uh, system. Great. Uh, last chance for questions? And we will move on to our next item, which is uh, well, uh, we're going to you want to say yeah. 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 We'll, we'll get out of your way before you actually <laughs> yeah, go do some taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. If any of you can sneak up here and sit at the table, go ahead. If you can hear better. Okay. Uh, new business, not action. Uh, who, Kim? I think Tim is actually going Tim, to go ahead and stand up. Oh, okay. okay. You're front and center. I don't know if I need to stand up, but uh, I feel privileged to be here today uh, as a uh, in front of you guys with as as the uh, chair of the, the Missoula Business Improvement District Marketing Communications Committee. Uh, I'd just like to say if you guys have any questions. If I'm not making something clear, please uh, let me know. But uh, the the uh, as you know, you move, work with the Parking Commission and the, and the BID, various other agencies are already partnering up on the Greater Missoula Business uh, uh, the uh, Master Plan, and we're here today to see whether or not we can't get you guys to partner up with us on something else as well. Uh, I'm here with. Uh, Julie and uh, uh, Kim uh, from the MDA because we're working very closely together with respect to marketing and communication. Um, uh, a lot of work's been done over the last uh, year or so with respect to uh, what we should be doing with marketing, including some surveys that have gone out. We have copies of, the, of, of one of the surveys that we sent out to business owners. Uh, to them, actually. The to stakeholders. The stakeholders. Stakeholders and business yes. owners. And um, if you guys would like a copy, uh, Julie has them for you. The, re the reason that, that we're going to just refer to them is, is that um, we wanted to make sure we knew who we were addressing before we decided to try and market to them, in a nutshell. And. Uh, one of the one of the components that has come out of, of, of these surveys is clearly parking is a is a, is a huge concern, um, whether it be perceived or real. Uh, you guys know that better than anybody, I'm sure. But you know what? That's what we were able to to ascertain with our surveys as well. And you'll find that in there. Um, just as an example, I we had I think we had a 20% return. We did. Which is considered phenomenal by by you know whatever standards these things are measured so we felt like we we had some pretty good information on this stuff and um, um, there were uh, well let's just say the parking was was created as, as one of the highest priorities let's just put it simply you can look for yourself in there or if you have specific questions so as as a, as a marketing <coughs> Hard hat. Um, we're trying to ascertain a way to change the perception of parking in downtown. Um, we don't feel that people truly understand, you know, the the, uh, the parking uh, situation. Um, we don't feel that that, that we, we feel the, the parking availability is clearly better than people think it is, and we think that we we if, if done well, we think that we can change those perceptions. We think it would be kind of a long-term, maybe three-year process or so. And that's kind of what we're pitching today. Um, the uh, BID has committed uh, $40,000 uh, annually to a marketing campaign. 
the MBA has committed $10,000 annually to a marketing campaign. Uh, we're, 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 we're wanting this to be a three-year uh, campaign, but we, we feel like since we're partnering up with uh, other groups with respect to the master plan and, and other things, we really feel it's appropriate that we partner up uh, with the Parking Commission as well. And so uh, we're before you asking uh, if you would consider um, help, helping us fund this thing. Um, our, our feeling is that if we do, if we were able to, for instance, we just kind of put the number at 100,000 a year, if we were able to approach anything like that, and we feel like we did a very, um, very good job with marketing, uh, that we would be able to not only change the perceptions with respect to parking, transients, and some of the other problems, but we also feel like if we do a good enough job, a lot of other people who are kind of uh, fringely in the fringes of, of the downtown might want to ride on our coattails, and this may be something that could turn into uh, a really, really positive thing for downtown Missoula. A lot, of, a lot of this type of stuff has been done and is being done in very successful other downtown uh, uh, areas, most notably is Spokane. They have a partnership where they have funding arms, they have parking arms, and they have uh, administrative arms. And uh, <clears throat> so we're kind of shooting for a model that's kind of similar to that. We're kind of shooting for, for a way to pool resources and, and really, as a BID guy, not only as the chairman of the committee, but as a rate payer, you know, our biggest challenge is to take every dollar and leverage that money uh, into something bigger than we started with. And that's really what we're here about with you guys today. We really want to try and offer uh, our pocketbook, you might say, and see whether we can leverage it together and, and, and uh, do, do something that, that I'm pretty sure it's never been done before in Missoula on this scale or uh, with this kind of collective mind. Uh, I think it's a pretty historic opportunity, particularly given the uh, the uh, place we're at with the with the master planning process, etc. And that's pretty much it. I do have some examples here too of. Um some ad advertising that Downtown Boise has done in conjunction with their BID, their Downtown Association, and their Parking Commission together, and showing how all three can kind of fit in and promote each other and work together on that. I think one of the most important <coughs> things that, that Tim mentioned um, is the leveraging aspect and the and collectively being able to just do such a, a job that we can't do independently. $10,000 a year is not going to um, make a difference. So if we can take our $10,000 and, and the Business Improvement District's money and the Parking Commission and possibly MAEDC or a, CBB. Uh, the CVB money, which we spoke with Barb, and, and collectively not collectively create a campaign professionally done where where we, our customers, are remembering and wanting to come down here. We need to get, one of the things in the survey states that 80, that the majority of, of the, the retail businesses downtown, the majority of their, their clientele are the professional people that work downtown. Well, we need to get our local people shopping downtown. We need to, to show them how wonderful it is to be downtown. And um, I think collectively, if we do a comprehensive come to Missoula, come to downtown Missoula and see what we have to offer, we will be so much more effective than singly trying to create something um, independently. Julie, like I said, these are great examples of, you know, this is, this is the logo for the Business Improvement District. This is the logo for the Downtown Association. This is for Seattle. For Seattle, and you could just see if we're able to do this, and obviously, whether you're a marketing major or not, it's a known fact. The more consistent you are with your with your marketing, and more consistent you are with your message, the more effective you're going to be. So, although these are different entities, you can see how they pulled their logo together and kind of made it work. Once again, it's just so much more effective in the overall message. 
any advertising to that gets um, <coughs> pitched, I think you can expect that if it's good enough that other businesses downtown may be interested in shirt tailing, like they do in a lot of the MDA tabs, for instance, at certain times. Um, the uh, you, 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 part of what has really worked downtown that I know are, are um, collective advertising campaigns where one little neighborhood get, gets together and puts it all together like hip strip or uh, when, when Tammy and, and Zimmerino and, and myself uh, did some stuff, those were very effective things. And so the, the collective nature of it seems to be proven as the way to go. We, we see this as just one heck of an opportunity to uh, take a step that we just haven't been able to afford to do before. And so uh, we really want to make sure that we have everybody on board that, that we can possibly get. And um, for the record, I wanted the fines increased. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I think you guys knew that anyway. <laughs> but um, so, so specifically, what we'd like to do is, is hit Jeff for like fifty thousand. I'll just lay it right out for you. Um, but uh, again, um, we just want you to consider, if possible, um, something that that could be meaningful to help to help this thing uh, move ahead. And, and then maybe, uh, if it's good enough, it may, may be something that you might want to be interested in committing a little more to in the, in the next year or two. Um. I think Julie can speak to, um, I don't know what city it was, but it's, it's, a similar, it's a similar program to what we're talking about. And essentially, where the Parking Commission would quote unquote come in on this is every piece of advertising that is done out of this group, there is a parking component in every ad. It's down, a lot of downtowns do it, but downtown Phoenix is a good example of it. Spokane does a good job of that as well, and also downtown Boise, where no ad leaves without some kind of parking component on it. Um, Phoenix, Arizona has a component where it's there's a spot for you. So every ad that goes out from the downtown partnerships there's a catch catch line on there that um, there's a spot for you to park in downtown Phoenix, Arizona, and it's been really successful for them. Um, and it's it's simple and it's easy and it's clean, but it just sends that message that it's easy to get down there, it's easy to find a place to park, and it's not expensive, and it's you know overcoming perception problems that every downtown in the country has. We're not the only ones dealing with this. So, questions. I have one. John? Um, so we're talking about a consistency, right? And consistency, and, and I tend to agree with you about that. Consistency in the message, consistency in the advertising. <clears throat> so we're talking about a three year program here, or we're talking about a forever program here. I mean, I'm a little confused by it. That seems incongruent to me. Okay. Uh, we're, we're asking to put together a three year program, but. As members, you know, as a BID board member, you know, we're, we don't think we can get much of the job done. You know, I mean, we, with with this particular thing, we can. But my God, we have we have so many other committees. We have a streetscapes committee. We have, you know, a bunch of other work that that really we just just initiated. And so we're we're hoping we get to continue um, uh, that you know that the ratepayers vote us in for another term. So if that's the case, certainly we would take whatever. Um, uh, progress we have made, or whatever we've learned, and then apply that into the next term. I think and three years and so, so my thought is just is if we are if we do a good enough job with this, that it could be something that could just be part of the program for however long, for for however long it, it goes, and uh, um, that that's really what I meant about that. Uh, what today, what I'm asking is just that we can can. Can, can agree to something for one, two, and three years. So I think we don't years know whether we'll be even around as a BID after that, you know, so. Yeah. I think we should look at, I mean, I, I think what, when we said three years, the idea was that to do this and to do this correctly, we're looking at the commitment of, 
outside of just their constraints, a minimum of three years because what we are looking for is this consistency. So it's not to say that it'd be limited to that and wouldn't go on beyond that. We just, for a short-term goal, a minimum of three years and then hopefully progressing and beyond that. So this, can I just keep going for a minute? So this is a comprehensive marketing plan, which is a lot of advertising, you know, marketing, everything goes in marketing. Um, so $100,000 this year, $100,000 next year, and $100,000 the next year. Is there a way to continue, keep the continuity, keep it all going, where you have fixed costs up front or upfront costs that then decline, so it's not $100,000 a year? It's, it's very possible, I think. I think one of the things is you certainly buy, you know, if you've got a little bigger um, purse at the outset, you're going to, you know, you're going to buy better value. You know, in terms of just time, you know, for advertising media. But uh, I think that that's something that you would look very hard at on uh, every year. You would look; you just wouldn't throw a hundred thousand bucks at it and say, "Well, we got that done," and then let it run for three years. I think you would look at it every every year and just say, "Well, what did we do that was right? What did we do that was wrong? Maybe we only need to spend <coughs> seventy-five. Um, I think that's a darn good question. I'd be at, at asking that question. <laughs> The initial costs up front are going to be significantly higher because we all need to find a firm that will create this this plan. And so, I, once right. again, with the consistency, we would not want to reinvest the will every year. And we would hope that upon sending out an RFP, RFQ, however we did that, and upon choosing a local firm to create this comprehensive plan, that we would move forward with that. So, and initially, you are Correct. And, and the initial cost three. of that firm Correct. because it would be in right. place. And now there'll be an ongoing fee, I yeah, would imagine, right. but yeah. certainly not what the original fee is in then creating the plan to begin with. Are we talking about improving downtown association's website? As that has been discussed. Because I noticed with some of the thing that came around was Boise's website, from Boise's website. Yeah. And I. I think it looks quite nice, but the, the boys yeah. one. Uh, now, one thing I think is important to, to note here, though, is this really isn't about the downtown association specifically. So I really, <coughs> it would be an error for me to say that any of this money would be spent improving our website right. because the idea is to not necessarily promote the downtown association or the business improvement district or the parking commission or CD. It, it's to bring people downtown, so I don't see that 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 money would be spent improving our website. But that is right, something the downtown asked. association has looked at doing independent of this campaign. Which would be a good idea because people go to websites anymore. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm spending money on websites now and I never did that before. <laughs> yeah. You know. But that would not be something that would be a part of this. Although it would be probably be tagged on, you know, that the, a lot of the information certainly would. would well, to the various websites so sure. that they link up. I mean, sure, like they do now. Okay. Well, they might end up through downtown Missoula website. Absolutely. Right. That's what kind of. I mean, right now we've got a separate website for the BID and the MDA, and a lot of downtowns do it where there's one website for downtown for their downtown, and right. all entities partnering are represented on there. Yeah. And it's I quite think, effective. I think Boise maybe is doing that. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. And Spokane too. If you go and yeah. look, Spokane's you know, a great example of that. Impressed. A lot of Spokane's. Excuse me. Go ahead. A lot of Spokane's entities are uh, the, the ones that we're talking about here. They're interwoven already. Right. Exactly. They, they've been they've been operating for 12 years. Right. They're they're really they really rock yeah, for sure. Uh, quick question: What is the downtown association contributing to this? Um, Our entire budget, which is ten thousand dollars. Our entire marketing budget, which is ten thousand okay. dollars. They are doing an awful lot of work, though, too. That's our cash contribution, would be the 10000 Given the amount of money, I think we need to take this under advisement. Oh, sure. Sure. And, and uh, we need to talk about it a little bit after all the board members have sat down with their cup of coffee and sure. the previous sure. audit statement. So uh, if we could table this until next meeting, and Absolutely. we'll bring it up. For Thanks for your Thanks time. Very if you guys have questions at all, contact any of us. Yeah, Thanks. thank you very much. Thank for you. Coming. You're welcome to stay if you want. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <thanks. laughs> Communities and employers and and 
individuals for their own families want, want, want a broad education, whether it's at the two-year level so-called training or, or at whatever. Bruce, Bruce Buckley from across the street from the Millennium Building. Now I'm from the Millennium Building. Kevin Gordon. From the hall. From the hall. From the hall. From the hall. Okay, um, thank you for making the time and thank you for coming to hear what I have to say. I, I hope everybody can see, okay, I'm kind of limited on where I can stand and what I can do. Um, the Parking Commission uh, entered into a contract with Carl Walker and Associates, a nationally ranked parking consulting design firm, and uh, with Oz Architects to undertake the feasibility study for the possibility of building a multi-level parking structure on what the Parking Commission calls the riverfront lot. A little history um, on this spot will help understand. This picture uh, is an aerial photo of the downtown of the riverfront of Missoula about 1925. I think that's where, where it comes from. And if you um, look at it, you'll see the area that we're talking about is right here. This is before the Army Corps of Engineers built the levee that included the flood wall that created the riverfront lot parking lot. I'd also observe this rather large island. Uh, there's a small structure on there that was a little shed that held a generator. That's how they lit Higgins Avenue Bridge was with a little generator that was on that island. And another thing that the Parking Commission will find interesting is that in 1947, there was a major capital campaign in Missoula to raise funds to turn this into a park. In 1948, the spring floods came along and washed it away. The mayor at the time was, un, uh, was not able to be reelected due to that and the fact that she was also the mayor that installed parking meters in downtown. Juliet Gregory, who was Missoula's only uh, woman mayor. But you can see that this area uh, was part of the river. And it was the flood control project that was undertaken in the 1960s by the Army Corps of Engineers. And this is just a diagram that shows you know, what they did to, to protect that area from flooding. Um, you can see on the left-hand side the Higgins Bridge and down on the far right side where it says flood wall, that's where the flood wall comes into the dike. It's where we have a little boat ramp that uh, was constructed by the AmeriCorps about seven years ago, maybe six years ago. This is the neighborhood. This is an aerial photo of the neighborhood. Um, Google hasn't caught up with Kevin's big hole. The old bank building is still there, but you can see on the left is Higgins Avenue. Uh, lower left corner is the riverfront and where the riverfront park, part of Karis Park and the riverfront parking lot, the subject of the study, um, is located. And then the, the white square, of course, is the Holiday Inn. That's where we are right now. Um, this area, appears somewhat open. It's great for a surface lot. This lot was part of the impetus for why Higgins Bridge was built the way it was. Initially, it was going to be built like the Orange Street Bridge. It was going to be, um, the, the highway was going to, the street rather, was going to be just built up on berms. The downtown business community said, no, we need to be able to pass through underneath. Uh, and that's what ended up making Higgins Bridge up on those uh, piers as it goes through by Karis Park. Uh, the business community wanted to be able to make that transition under the bridge, and so that's why that's there. Uh, 
But there's some other things there in that area. Uh, the yellow line are two are, are, are sewer lines that come down Patty Street from here to here and then come over to the lift station. And then in the 1980s, the city built a sewer that brings sewage down to the lift station and then it has a, what's called a force main which pumps it back the same direction. That's why you have the two lines there. They're, the one's coming down and the other's going back the other direction. This serves a lot of downtown Missoula and the, um, the uh, one that comes down Patty Street serves the, the neighborhoods up to the north and a little bit east. The other thing that's going on down there are power lines. We have um, three main 100 kilovolt power lines that come through the area to the substation. There was a time when those power lines came, uh, two of them came straight through where this hotel is and they were relocated around uh, John Toole Park on the south side of the river and then they come across here instead of going where the hotel is. These 100 kilovolt lines um, create a challenge because under the National Electrical Safety Codes, you have to keep uh, distance from them. It's just not safe. And their minimum distance is around 20 feet. Uh, right now, the lines that cross the uh, parking lot on the right-hand side of the picture, they're about 30 feet, a little bit more than 30 feet above the parking lot. That changes with the weather. When the weather's warmer, they sag a little bit more, but it's around 30 feet. The uh, three lines that go over Higgins Bridge, the ones that are kind of at the top of the picture, those are up quite a bit higher because they have to clear the bridge, and they have to clear uh, the bridge by that 20 feet. So you've got the the distance from the ground to the bridge and then the 20 feet above it. There is another part of this that we also have to deal with because of the substation. The little uh, polygon in green is an access gate that Northwest Energy needs to have to get into their substation with trucks and equipment. If you'll look, if you'll see that, the uh, area inside that compound is pretty full of equipment, except for that one little area inside the gate where they can get equipment in to work on the transformers, the electrical lines, and whatever. The Northwest Energy Company has a perpetual easement to get through to that area to get to their, um, to get through to their equipment represented partially by this parallel line, but this parallel line also uh, represents the clearance that we need to get traffic through from one side of the bridge to the other. Right now there are delivery trucks that come to the Wilma, there are garbage trucks that surface Karis Park, there are um, events um, at the Wilma, touring buses, stage set trucks, you name it. But there's a lot of traffic that goes through this area underneath the Higgins Bridge. And right now, that green line is, or that green parallel line is the one way that they do it. The other is, is we have circulation. You can see that there is a, an arrow here. So we have kind of a, goes this direction, goes this direction. So in order to maintain that access, that problem also has to be um, considered. At the very north end of the area, in the dotted green line, is a mountain water well. Mountain water derives its water from wells, serves Missoula, and that well is, is hooked into the major uh, water system that um, services this part of town. When we built the uh, Superno parking structure, uh, that water line was replaced, and it was replaced rather expeditiously by mountain water because when we uncovered it and they discovered its condition, they were a little bit nervous 
because there was only one valve between that pipe and the reservoir up on Waterworks Hill. It's a huge amount of water pressure. It's a huge water service. I believe it's a 21 inch water main that comes to and through that area. There's another consideration and that goes back to the old picture that I showed you. When the Army Corps of Engineers built the dike, they entered into an agreement with the city of Missoula that we, we, the city, would maintain that dike and inspect it and make sure that it maintained its integrity because it's protecting a lot of downtown property. One of the things that you might have heard about in the past was if trees larger than four inches in diameter grow there, the city is obligated to remove them because, because in case of a flood event, those trees might get pushed over, their root balls might yank out the riprap and thereby damage the integrity of the levee. On the land side of the uh, levee, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, when we spoke with them, said that their guidelines right now are for, please, nothing closer than 15 feet to the toe of the slope. And that's what's represented by the blue line. Now, that's not sacrosanct. If you've got enough money, you can build up to and inside that blue line. But the Army Corps of Engineers will have to approve the construction. So you can see with all the various lines that I've drawn on here, what looked initially like an open spot is not very open at all. And it's more than in just two dimensions, it's that third dimension of height as well. Oh, and the last thing, of course, are the fish. Public art, piece called Returnings. It is what's called a site-specific sculpture. It's there because it's the riverbank. I don't think that this is a, a, a greatly significant issue. This sculpture could be moved, but it's there. And it's another one of the things that complicates the site. Um, the first thing that Carl Walker and Oz did was look at a draft scheme that was put together by CTA when they were considering, I think as part of working on the study for the bank, where could parking for the new bank go? And this is their drawing and it's laid over the, uh, the drawing that we just looked at. And you can see that up here in this area is the existing Superno structure, and the, the study that they did shows a parking lot coming off that structure, coming down and kind of going around the substation. And this was, uh, and it would, it would load from this upper deck, and I don't have any more information how it would load in, um, on the lower levels or anything like that. But this, this is the first thing that we looked at, and we said, well, can this work? The first thing that you'll notice here, and you won't notice it because it's not very clear, is this circle is the well. And so the problem with, one of the problems with this design is, is that it hasn't taken into account the well. Can the well be moved? Can we drill a new well? If you've got enough money, yeah, that could be done. Um, it just adds a complexity to it. The other thing is, is this design doesn't really do very much for maintaining the connection under the bridge or the access to the um, substation that Montana or that Northwest Energy needs. The other thing is that the power lines on this side and I'll talk about this a little bit later, these power lines would have to be raised. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. These power lines, the structure's built right on top of them. And so that's a problem too, with that design. Well, they've, des they've designed the parking deck to be right on top of where 
these three lines, this is where the, this is the, the, the tower that the three lines are on. And the design is right on top of those lines. This is a picture of the substation. And I wanted to use this to explain a little bit about what's going on here. The area that's circled, that is the lowest westernmost set of 100 kV lines. These are the ones that kind of go right through the middle of the site. They're problematic because of where they are. When we talked to Montana Power, or I'm sorry, Northwest Energy, and we said, okay, how much of a problem is this? Can, can do these have to be here? Can we move them? I said, well, they do kind of have to be here, but you can raise them. We said, okay, what does that take? They said, you need to have a freestanding steel structure. Those are the lines. A freestanding steel structure, kind of like that one, that will carry the lines at least 20 feet above the surface of your parking deck. And you have to have one inside the substation and one on the river side of your parking deck to carry those wires from the substation to a tower on the river across to the other side. Height 40 to 45 feet tall. And it would be a structure very similar to this A-frame steel structure to carry it. As I was thinking about this this morning, I'm not sure whether uh, there are procedures in place for them to get that approved by the Army Corps of Engineers or not, because they right now their towers are right in the dike, right in the levee. And I don't know what a new structure like that would mean. OK, so now I'm going to run through some of the different designs that Carl Walker went through. Now, as they got into this process, they were charged with looking at maximize parking spaces, pay attention to the restrictions um, of the site, try uh, to create a flat space so that we could use this for more than parking, that we could use it for public assembly. The Riverfront Market, for example, or other events that the community has that we could have just another venue where people could gather. That was one of the things that they looked at. Another thing that was part of their consideration that we asked them to look at was screening the substation. Now, if you've lived here forever, just your eyes have just kind of built up a callus and you don't really notice it unless you study it. Um, but it really is not a very attractive part of our community. All the wires that go to it, the equipment, it's just not very pleasant. So we asked them in their consideration to look at how can we better screen the substation? The first uh, run-up that they came was for 326 spaces, and they did that with a combination of having a surface lot and structured parking. Now, the existing riverfront lot has about, I think 95 spaces is the number that we've used. So the net new spaces is 231 spaces. This is um, their first option and I just drew in with the yellow line, the, the sewer lines that are there. And this thing's right on the top of it. And I'll talk some more about moving the sewer line as we look at some later options. But what this does is this would screen the parking structure. You couldn't see it. or It would, it would screen the um, substation. You wouldn't see it because this building would be in front of it. It maintains the access through the area that we wanted for trucks and, and car traffic. And it does maximize the number of parking spaces. Well, it doesn't maximize it, but it gets quite a number of parking spaces. It does not interfere with the well, but it has one of the other fatal flaws in that you can see those three power lines go right through the middle of it. So then, actually both those sets go through it, so you can see that, that that's kind of problematic. So then, their next option, got, um, it was a little bit different. It had an internal ramping system. That is, the ramps were right inside, and 
that, per, that configuration consumes a lot of space, but they were able to go a little higher and they got more space in the surface lot. And that's what this represents. Again, the same problem with the power lines going over it and it's still going over the sewer lines. 1B has an outside ramping system. And that's what this looks like. So you got a little bit smaller surface lot and the ramping on the outside leaves more internal space left over for parking. The next one we looked at had a larger surface lot and a smaller footprint for the, um, uh, for the structured parking. You can see that it, it helps us avoid the power line issue altogether. Not as much screening, obviously, of the substation. Um, still have the problem with the sewer. Both this, uh, this design and the other designs, you may have noticed, consume a lot of parkland. Um, to make this stuff fit, to make it possible to warehouse cars, to move them internally, to circulate them in and around the area, there, uh, there is a need to consume a lot of the park. And that has to be factored into our consideration as well. 2A is a little bit smaller surface lot and a little bit bigger, but then we're back to um, power lines. The third one, uh, we had them move the driving lane to the south side of the structure just to see if, if that geometry would make it any more feasible. That blocks the substation, requires a big chunk of parkland to get through there, and we still have power line issues. Level four, it was the same, this was the same kind of a problem. The difference in this one and the one I showed you before is what happened with the flat space. The previous, this design ended up, the flat space was C-shaped. In other words, this is what was flat. This is where the ramping was. And we said, well, you know, what good is that for public assembly? We can't put people on there and it doesn't work. So they, said, they changed it and they said, okay, we'll move it. And so now what this design did is it created, this is the flat space, which we thought was better. That's more in keeping with you know, being able to have the parking structure serve more than one purpose. Still the problem with um, the power lines. You'll notice too, in this case, We've avoided building on top of the sewer lines and the lift station. So we don't have, in this iteration, we don't have to move the sewer lines because we're not building on top of them. So that was another uh, one of the goals that we were trying to reach with this design. The uh, Fifth option, we said, well, the others were so problematic, we were orienting this thing the wrong way. Let's turn it. Let's turn it and we'll have it parallel the bridge. And let's just bite the bullet and say, to make this work, we've got to get rid of the sewer lines. So here they showed how this sewer line could be abandoned. We would have to build new sewers from this point, come down along bring it in and then bring it back in to the lift station uh, and the other sewer lines would come from Patty Street. So that, this option involved having to do a lot of work changing the uh, lift station. It also consumes a great deal of the park. In fact, it goes into the levee restricted area, the, the area that they want is no build, but it consumes the park all the way to the river. So your experience walking down the trail, you'd come out under the bridge and then you would go all the way here before you saw a park again. Uh, the upside is this could be used to create more parks. So we, instead of having a, where the park narrows down to an area that's really not good for anything but grass, we, under this uh, design, could actually create some green space 
that was meaningful and conceivably could be totally redesigned. It could play off the boat ramp idea. We could have a whole new kind of recreational uh, activity center in the downtown because this would create it. The trade-off is you're going to get a parking structure right along, you, uh, right along the trail for the um, depth of that. This would be, a, it, the, the, it wouldn't be too, the, the parking structure? Space. Yeah, just a, wouldn't be much space between the trail and the structure to landscape. No, it, it would be, it'd be about five feet. Bushes. It'd be right there. Bushes. Yeah, <laughs> some bushes, yeah. Um, but again, in this case, we still, we, we had that levy issue and we said, well, okay, well, what if they said no? Let's back it off. Let's see what happens. And so we backed it off. In this design, we've totally solved the overhead power line issue. We've had to relocate the um, sewers. We're away, far enough away from the uh, levee that the Army Corps of Engineers doesn't have any say in it. We have a new sewer lift station that's tucked in and allows us to maintain this larger park area We've maintained access to the Northwest Energy substation. Um, and as you can see by the blue line, we've stayed, uh, stayed away from the levee. So this, this worked, um, but we only get 59 spaces for it. And that's not worth it. So looking back again at this, aerial photo of the, of the uh, area, there is pretty clear evidence that there is parking demand uh, for the downtown. There's going to be increased parking demand um, both from the first interstate bank project and there's going to be increased parking demand as the urban renewal district to the um, east of, of Patty Street fills in a little bit more and as activity north of Front Street starts to, to take hold. So you can see that there's going to be a need for parking in this area. The riverfront parking lot, looking at it, has got a lot of problems. If you have enough money, you can solve the problems, but there's always going to be these trade-offs. The power lines, we talked about that at last month's meeting. The prospect of having 44 foot tall steel towers on the riverfront is that's going to be a real difficult one to sell to the community. I think likewise consuming up large parts of the park are going to be difficult to sell to the community. What we try to do in our thinking is we're trying to cons we would we would consume park but you're, the trade-off would be you'd get more park right next door so it's more usable. So it might, that might be something that, that could be uh, sellable. The other issues of can we, can we drill a new well? Sure, if you've got enough money and, and you're willing to, to undertake that. The question that, that Carl Walker and Oz Architect uh, considered is can it be done here feasibly? Their conclusion was no, it cannot. Now feasible is a term of art. It's going it, to make it happen. It can happen, but there will be trade-offs. And the question the parking commission has to look at is: Is it worth paying what it will take to make it work there? And are the trade-offs worth making? So, I th I think what I can say to you is: This isn't going to be the place you still have the same problem of the need. And I think it was mentioned in the BID presentation, uh, you need to find some partners and work in partnership and so that the solution to the problem is spread out a little bit broader. Uh, I, I don't think from, from what we've uncovered that the Parking Commission is gonna solve this problem at this location. So. Questions. Those of you who are involved in the, the bank, I'm particularly interested in hearing about your observations and you as the neighbors, I'm interested in having, having your questions or observations too. 
Jeff, I'm just curious. They, they can't just take the, the power lines that are there that are, that are causing the problems, you know, not, not the one to the far east, but the, the other two. Uh, the ones that come through here. And just have them come over, like, directly in line with Ryman and just go up, or Patty, I mean, and go up Patty and then go into the power station or and leave them at their same height, just move them? Yeah, I I don't know if you could do that. It would it would cost to do any of that to, to do any of that. I mean, the current poles that are there. I mean, I don't know. I just it seemed like that's a lot easier than building brand new forty five foot. Towers. Well, that they only have to build them that high to clear a structure. Right, but if you if you just move the the power lines to come in line with Patty and just go, you know right along that line and, and take him out of play in that area, I guess, then then you're not worried. I mean, you're keeping him at the same height. Well, you're talking about, and I'm not an, an engineer, so excuse me if I, if I don't give a, a real intelligent answer, but to bring them up here and to turn that corner, right. that's, yeah, that's going to be, that will be the toughest part, is turning the corner. Jim? Yeah. In the earlier discussions that we had with the Northwestern Energy, we, we asked the, that same question. And it is a very expensive proposition for a couple reasons. One, making that kind of turn, but also because of the area, if I remember correctly, this is quite a while ago, the area that the mine served is quite yeah. large. Yeah. And the temporary patches and disconnects in order to down those lines and reconnect them, whether they're really phenomenal. The numbers that they threw at us initially were in the you know, over $10 million. Yeah. Uh, which, again, I don't understand yeah. that. This one, this one to move to move this one. I mean, to raise this this the one that runs here. It would be about three hundred thousand dollars to to just to raise this set of hundred kV lines. Plus, you get the the tower right here on the riverfront. Bruce, Alan, any observations or questions? Just looking at the area, the all the problems that you've presented, just structurally with that site, and then looking across the street at the parking area for this hotel and the corner of Patty and Fred, and it, it kind of looks like a no-brainer. <laughs> I mean. Is there some way of addressing with creative design a way that would satisfy that that looks like a lot more opportunity for parking um, without those same structural problems? And maybe adding to some interesting uh, approaches to the downtown, you know, considering the walkways, considering how tying the walkway that will come off Bank Street with the new building, um, the traffic circulation that will shift with the uh, changes in the in the bank building, tying together the space further to the east um, in a, at a pedestrian scale and an interesting, making the, the parking structure part of an interesting downtown feature rather than just sort of a monolith. Well, I was just gonna say, um, I know that the bank has been in conversation and d did you wanna follow up on that? Yeah, if I could. We always knew that even if we could yeah. deck parking over lot we couldn't solve the whole problem there yeah so there's been a dialogue with the owner of that corner lot and with the owner of the holiday inn about whether we can can do something there and the banks kind of picked that up because we decided that it was probably preferable for those discussions to be corporate level to corporate level rather than city or parking commission to the corporation located in Cincinnati and another one in Denver um, and, and we're, we're making progress on that. What we're actually talking to Federated about right now is buying or leasing air rights over their parking so that they continue to have their surface parking and, you know, and kind of, in my perfect world, the front street um, level would be retail with parking above that and even the possibility of housing above that if, if you had an enterprising developer and we've been talking to a couple that may have some interest in doing this if we can close the deal with federally. They don't seem to have any interest in selling 
that piece of ground. And we weren't getting very far until, you know, we, we brought up the idea of air rights. And luckily their real estate guy spent enough time in New York, as did I, that air rights aren't an alien concept to him at all. And so he's, he's pretty intrigued. And if we can do that, then that's the best of all worlds. The other is a negotiation with the Holiday Inn, and you can get a big enough plate that you can really do a very efficient parking structure if, if, they, if they would be interested in doing it. So, I mean, we, we've been pursuing that track all along. along. The, obviously, the advantage to the riverfront lot is we own the ground. So, you know, we, we don't have a, a land purchase, in the, in the, in the, particularly with an absentee owner. Any other questions from the commission? I think I think what Ellen outlined for you is is a very promising, desirable way to go in terms of being able to build something, uh, as Bruce said, that will be an asset to the downtown that will work with the development of commercial real estate and residential real estate and be something that that's both integrated and beautiful. Um, I don't think that we really can look at this problem without trying to, to reach a little bit higher than, than this shows we have to reach. I think we can do better than this. So. Did Northwestern Energy ever put a, a dollar on moving the substation? In 1985, I went to um, Montana Power Company with Mayor Toole and some other people, Ron McDonald. And, we sat down with them and they said, sure, it can be moved. And in 1985, it was 12.3 million. And they said, you write the check, we'll make it move. Nobody had 12.3 million dollars at that time. And it's, and it's not changed. The problem with it is, is really that it's not so much real estate, it's, it's what Kent said. Rerouting all of these power lines is tremendously complex. And I'd like to see the hand of anyone in here who wants these 100 kV lines in your neighborhood. It's just very, very difficult. The solution that we got for this hotel involved routing them to the south side of the river and running them along Missoula, a, a, a platted Missoula Alley that's not there because of the, the bluff over the river. And then running it through a park and then along the riverfront where the Milwaukee Railroad used to run. So, I mean, that's how tough it is to solve those kinds of problems. Steve, Steve Grover, this is your last time, I'm kind of surprised he's not here today, but I was talking with him later, and he had talked about you know, some monies or whatever that he thought was available for parking structures and whatnot. I mean, has he been involved in this dialogue? Oh, yeah. 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 Well, we've been trying to work the new markets tax credit piece of it. Mm -hmm. And we inch a little closer all the time. Two little points. Uh, I think on the back of an envelope in our discussions, we kind of think we need about 400 spaces, mm -hmm. which is a sizable structure. And according to Mr. Gordon, if you can trust them, it's about 25,000 in space. Without <laughs> <laughs> saying a word. Because we hold you to it. <laughs> no more than that, right? Yeah. No, I, because steel and concrete are both uh, been suffering a lot of inflation over the last three or four years, uh, which this structure is all steel and concrete. So it's, it's going to dramatically affect the cost of the spaces. So this is a challenge. Do any of you have a question? Here's your <coughs> opportunity. I'm, I'm just curious if the Parking Commission has an interest in pursuing something in the Holiday Inn, Macy's joint we, area. We always been. have. Yeah. That's where we started. How, how, how do you feel the best way to proceed with that is? First um, Interstate Bank buy it from Macy's. <laughs> and get the, the, the air secured. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and air rights are, uh, it is a new concept for people to comprehend. And, you know, I think it's easier from an understanding perspective to say we can lock that thing up with a lease, whether you think of it as a long-term land lease and for, for <coughs> financing uh, abilities 
convert that to air lease, but if you think of us securing that with a long-term lease, um, uh, it's going to take a joint effort to make all that happen. Everybody has to be on the same page in terms of what it's going to cost. And to secure those, we don't have any, any issue with working with those groups to facilitate that. Um, but it's difficult to make that happen without knowing the level of interest and, and mechanisms to get that financed um, paid for. No, I, I think, go ahead, Carol. I'm sorry. I, I think that's originally was one of our primary desires. We felt, however, that we needed to really explore the possibility of, because we own the land, and it seemed like at first blush, doing a structure above the, the, this lot um, that already was in existence made some sense. And I think bringing Jeff on board and showing all the problems, to me anyway, indicates no, we back off this entirely if we've got to explore yeah. those other avenues. Well, at what point do we ever get to the level of doing something similar that was just done on, on that site to something in the, the, this area here? At what point would we ever engage uh, um, some consultants to design some things like that uh, this, for this area? This particular study costs approximately $30,000. Mm -hmm. I think we want to know that we have the ground yeah. under control before we would commit to those kinds of funds. Uh, I mean, we, we do have a finite yes. number of dollars, and that's one parking space that we just lost. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that I think would be helpful to facilitate the move to the next corner law is some architectural design, maybe not $30,000 worth, but at least a schematic design that would show how large footprint would need to be for a, for a three to four hundred car block. We've done that. Because you're going to have to speak not only with Macy's, but all of them. You have to go to somebody with the drawing and say, this is what we need. There it so, is. Yeah. <laughs> can you build it? <laughs> I think yeah, can build people it. can build it if you can get the parts and pieces right. put together. Building that's probably the easiest part. Oh, okay. Kevin, we've had Oz Architects look at that lot for, I would say, in the last 10 years. I mean, we have looked at it in a lot of different ways, and that's our most recent request to have those drawings put together that show the different levels and how high you can go and what you might get. So um, we, we, we're, we have definitely explored that option. So how many spaces? What? This is just kind of back of napkin stuff. It just depends on how many floors you build. One of the one of the interesting things with this is that what Macy's owns stops right here. This is Holiday Inn from here on out. So Macy's is parking on Holiday Inn property, and we haven't found any evidence of any recorded easements or legal agreements respect to that, and I'm not sure Macy's was aware of that until recently. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The people we're dealing with, we've been dealing with. Yeah. So, but you, you have no choice to get an efficient plate, but to deal with both Holiday and then mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and one of the glitches, as I remember, was that uh, Holiday Inn has a concern about visibility from Grunge Street. Oh, yes. <laughs> but probably. But I think, you know, the, I, I think that's a positive thing if the existing power building, when it comes down, to raise that visibility uh, right. that they don't currently have. Right. So it appears to me that we need to figure out a way to secure that. Um, we'll come it, awful close to it. I'm not sure if you want to have it absolutely secured. Yeah. But, but be but awful close to it before we start spending money yeah. to figure out what can go there and what can't. Uh, to me, it, I've always thought it's a better location than Riverside. I thought Riverside was better in an immediate sense because it was difficult getting people to talk and meet. Uh, but I think a parking lot on that lot serves the whole of downtown better than the Riverside lot. One of the big pluses with the river, Riverside was, was being able to screen that substation. Right. I mean, it is, it is. But then you're not down there. 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 You're
to do, you know. Yeah. I mean, well, but but you know, one of the real considerations was always that it had to be architecturally correct. Right. And um, you know, thus Pog's partnership with Carl Walker and not just build a parking garage. I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Just a quick look at this. I know it's done the back of that start your idea of getting retail and possibly residential or that is a great idea for that area. The small and again it depends on how much of the land you know we go into holiday in, but if I'm reading this correctly, the, the smaller one is about 45 cars per floor. The bigger one going more in, into the alley area is 67 to get to the 400 group right. right. way up there. So, it, you know, again, it, gets, it comes back to another question of how does, does that body begin to solve the, the one space problem? Well, I'm, what about the, the, the aspects of taking the other part of the hall and this parking lot over here where it's not as visible? Um, so I guess it'd be the east, northeast end of it, and kind of curls in there and expanding. That area is part of the company. It's a, 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 a bigger footprint. Another <clears throat> option that maybe shouldn't be totally discounted is with <clears throat> your auto bank is there's a, quite a large chunk of property there that would accommodate what we need collectively. The, the dilemma with that one that I see is we have a wonderful lot on the corner of Orange and Front and it's $30 a month to park in it, 30 bucks. It's the cheapest parking in Missoula, and we can't fill it up. And we could double the size of it. And so, yeah. is that is location it too far away? Too far away? To, uh, personally, I think it is. I think it is too far away. And, and, and I think the cost of it, I think air rights would be cheaper than the cost of that land. I but think there's, there's a higher, better use for that property. Worse. But we have to consider building for the future. I mean, it feels too far away right now, but as that urban renewal district expands and develops and infills more, that's not going to be too far away. And I would say in five to ten years, that's going to be right on. So if we're going to spend this kind of money now, I think we need to think about what's out for a couple more years. Thus the benefit of the master plan. Yes, well, exactly. well, not only the master plan, but I, I believe Mike Hickey pointed out that one of the options for that property was condominiums. Mm -hmm. Well, so the first three and four levels are parking, and then there's condominiums up on top. Yeah. So there are, you know, I don't think we should totally discount that, but I agree the corner of front and patty is the best, the optimum location because we don't have to deal with the fear that people won't go there and we have this massive debt to service. And it may not solve the 400 car delivery. It may be a partial solution. Right. Now, Alan, is not my recollection correct that that whole area across the front and behind the trailhead and the pearl is an abandoned alley? Or there was talk early on that perhaps the parking structure could go you know, further, um, would be further east, east um, than just the footprint of the of the Macy's lot, which, to me, when you can increase the the size of the structure and have one structure, you're going to be do you know having a more economic um, you know structure there. And it seems like that's not at all utilized, um, really. If, if we could just... Yeah, I mean, Holiday Inn, from what we can tell, owns, and Jeff may know more about this than I do because he was involved when the hotel was built. And I think Federated initially owned almost all of that land, didn't they? Or, they did. And there was a street or an alley, I don't remember which, that was vacated, went completely to Federated, and then when the hotel deal was done, property was sold all the way to the back of the old yeah. warehouse. 
I, it's been so many years since I looked at my UDAG files, <laughs> but, well, but that's where it is. I had time yeah. to pull all that up just recently yeah. because we were just trying to figure out what property lines were. It was incredulous to me that, that, that Macy's didn't own a third of where the park, no. five percent of where the park went. And you've got two entities that have no way to control their park. And that's a real issue for Holiday Inn all the time. They get downtown employee parking. Would the Parking Commission commit to pay Oz or somebody um, whatever the minimum fee would be to develop a not just a back the napkin kind of thing, but a, a floor plan that would at least give us some material we could go talk to Macy's and holiday with. I don't know if it's a few thousand dollars. Or to be used as a tool to, yeah, to use in discussions? Yeah. Would, would that be beneficial? I'll let um, you would know. Well, if you acquire the land, can, is it going to be enough? Yeah. to do. Yeah. It's kind of the chicken and the egg. Well, I think you can go higher than Central Park, for example, mm -hmm. and have that, you can have that retail, at least part of that 4B retail, and still go up a little bit higher. Uh, and some of the buildings that are around it, the Millennium Building. Uh, the new bank that building. High, but, the new uh, bank building. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I think it's just a, a consequence of downtown growing. Is I've, I've seen parking structures that or at least as tall as the Millennium Building in bigger cities. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you can do it right. I think it would. I don't know what the cost is. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how many wires cross that property. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean we, we've spent a year thinking we could build out over the roof. Yeah. Well, well, do you I have the rest of the for that area? No. <laughs> that, <laughs> but I, I, uh, you do. Well, until recently, I haven't felt like Confederate has been that eager to talk. And I don't know. First Thursday Bank is talking with them, or is it Holiday Inn that's talking First First Thursday Bank is talking with them. Rich Bolberg approached me a few weeks ago and said, hey, where are you guys at? There, people are after me wondering, where are the people on your end? There was an internal communication gap with the right. okay. There was communication okay. going on. Well, and you had a difference in Cincinnati and Seattle. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you had, I thought it was a brilliant idea. Uh, That'd be a stretch. Oh, no, but to uh, make the first level in that footprint retail and give it to Federated in return for the ground rights. And they don't seem, to, there have been discussions with them, they, they don't seem to be very interested in expanding their floor area right now. Hmm. Well, I don't know that we've ever talked about giving it to them, right? but, you know, there have been discussions about, you know, what if they picked up or enlarged their hiring product line or their furniture or something, you know, across the street. And, and I think if you've paid any attention to the news lately, Macy's is in a little bit of turmoil in terms of, of their performance right now. They're, they're laying people off and uh, I think they're closing some stores. Luckily, this one doesn't seem to have a bullseye on it. But, um, they, I mean, I think both uh, Mike Hickey and Tom Luger talked to them about yeah. that idea, and we hadn't gotten a bite yet. Maybe not even a minute. But, I mean, I, I, I have been talking to a developer who's interested in, in looking at doing that in a mixed fashion. I don't want to see any more downtown ground level parking structure if we can help it. I don't care if it's just the first 60 feet of depth that's retail, it needs to be retail. Do you remember that schematic I sent you that uh, we didn't invoice it? Yep. Perfect example. Yep. Could use a few more levels of parking in it. Yep. Well, I certainly concur with what, what you're saying. I, I think uh, well, you got to have the parking, but you don't, you don't need to dead and a half a block. Yeah. But maybe Tom's hit, hit a really good point. I mean, we need to think outside the box when it comes to, you know, federating. And if we have to put something like that on the table yeah. and make it work. I mean, Jeff talked about partnerships and his presentation and that's what we were about, I think, all of us. It's, it's going to be good for all of us. And keeping Federated or Macy's downtown is it's critical. critical. Um, I don't want to stop this discussion. It's healthy, but I don't want to lose board members because I, I believe we need to... Uh, we spent a lot of money on this report. Uh, Jeff spent a lot of time on it. 
I think we need to either approve or not approve the report, uh, so I need a motion uh, to one of those effects. Uh, uh, and, and then lastly, Jeff, I'm very impressed with your presentation, and I want to thank you for your diligence. And uh, uh, the next time you do this, could you be a little more positive? <laughs> yeah, I've got wire cutters at home. <laughs> you, you, you touched the wire. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. You made a very difficult issue easy to be willing to comprehend. But anyway. So would the motion be that um, we accept the... Uh, findings. The what now? Findings. The findings of Carl Walker that uh, the five plus options are not viable for Riverside Water. I think we need to put that in. Do you have that? that. Mm -hmm. I need a second. second. I second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the aforementioned motion signify by saying. All in favor of being opposed. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Aye. Aye. Opposed the same. Okay. Again, thank you, Jeff. Now, we can open this back up. This is a serious matter, and I don't want to cut it short. But I, I already lost one word, but I need a quorum, and I, I want to catch that. You know, Kevin, Kevin has brought up the question, and I'm just trying to get, get some, some deal for whether it's feasible at a little bit more than an asking level. Is that something? I uh, don't no, think we ever got to the, an answer to the question. Uh, is that something that wants to be pursued? I think before we get an answer, but even to open it up further to, you know, once you build a structure there of any size, you know, I know one of the concerns about how it ends, okay, you've taken away the front. So how do we bring their front now to Front Street as part of the structure? Once we get that, can't we really go back into their parking lot even further and make this footprint even larger? and solve the bigger problems. So you think like signage on structure? Signage or part of a, you know, if there's retail or main floor, is there a function of theirs in the front that, that makes sense? Do they need additional meeting space? Yeah. 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 Everybody in this downtown scrambles for meeting space. Yeah. We are bleeding to preserve yeah. street right now. And if there's residential on top, maybe they have a penthouse but something. Well, you have a very entrepreneurial owner of the hallway. Talk about somebody who's outside the box. He, he gets out there. And I, I know from uh, really observation that they are out meeting bushes to make sure their space is filled up. More so than I've seen them in some time. I think, Dave, I think we have to explore everything. So your, your question, is there money well, available? Yeah, yeah I, uh, I'm not going to say no, and I'm not going to say yes at this point. Yeah. But it's a, uh, like I said, uh, we don't have a lot to show for for us a pretty yeah. good expenditure. But I don't think we should shut doors. That's silly. This is a very important issue for, for the community. Uh, One question we I guess that, right. that comes to mind is, and I think this is kind of where kids go, is how much land do we need to be negotiating for to get an official product? I think yeah, that's why it's really all important. Do we need to, to get is it just where Macy's is currently parking, or do we need another 50 feet into the, the existing park? I don't know what the efficient footprint is. Well, I know that when I looked at it, they looked at the exact property of February. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was way compromised, especially when it came to internal ramping going up. Then they backed it off to a degree where they felt maximized the ability to ramp up and still build and get some efficiency of space there. So that was kind of part of that discussion too. So we were able to just look at numbers and say, okay, this is how much per floor um, with the ramp and so forth. And that was kind of a kickoff spot. Um, as I said, that's our second request of all is to put down some numbers. So and we you swing. Said, you sir, with your working with parking firm and, and what you know, what is, where are the brakes and efficiency? Is it 100 cars per floor? Is it, you know, there's got to be some type of. Right. And I know I was looked at that. And so that's why they chose the distance back that they did for that second drawing. 
uh, then we didn't pursue it any further in any further detail because our attention then went to this and we've been focusing on this so intensely um, and we thought we'd get through this feasibility study now perhaps this is our next focus and we need to look at that maybe formalize those drawings a little bit more well, let me try to give you some sense of urgency mm -hmm. about this because we're over there spending $28,000 a day on this job right now, every day in and out. And we're going to have a building built there in 18 months with no parking. And I don't want to be sitting here in 18 months saying, gee, did we get air rights things figured out with Mainsons? So somebody's got to take the bull by the horn here. I don't care if it's the bank or if it's the parking commission. I really feel it's the parking commission's job to find parking for this burgeoning downtown. Somebody's got to be flying to Cincinnati and sitting down talking to these people saying, what can we do here? And to do that, you've got to have a drawing. You know, if it costs 5000 bucks to do a drawing in three weeks, get her done. Well, I think before we do drawing, though, we need to, we need to have a conversation with Paul Ian. How interested are they? How much of space would be available? What would they want in return? What would they need as far as exposure? All those things need to be. We've had those talks. Right. Uh, Dan, you, were you at some of those talks? A few of them. I, I think there were a lot of them. I was not. Yeah. Well, I don't know. And there's been a lot more talk with Macy's, obviously, than there has been following in. But Macy's has been the challenge. I don't, you know, we haven't ever gotten any indication that Holiday Inn is going to be that much of a challenge as long as they get exposure. Mm -hmm. but, and, and hopefully the ability to control their parking lot. Could I? Go ahead. Um, I, I'm speaking out of turn and, and with no authority, but I guess I would have a suggestion that um, we obviously are just kind of, you know, we've had some talks, we don't we need someone to just pull things together. We pulled Jeff in to work on the riverfront um, project and really investigate everything. I, I think to have someone of his expertise to work with Alan, to work with the bank, and coordinate with Macy's and Holiday Inn to see what we can put together as far as a parcel and therefore then, you know, to get a size that would be um, workable both for the bank's needs and for, you know, some future, uh, see if we can't pull things together. Um, bring in another contract in with, with um, Jeff on board to um, work with, with Ann and get everybody on the same page. We don't... No. But that's what I don't know what, what do you think, Rod? I agree. Do you? I do. Um, someone needs to take the bull by the horns and, and bring it together. Uh, I think we walked away from it because we thought Riverside would work. And Riverside is not going to work. And we need to, I think we need to put the same effort into this location as we did in Riverside. I thought all along this was a better location. Yes, I agree. But it seemed like economically that was right. that was the reason for going to Riverside. Well, we have no ability to control the Macy's location. Well, I know Everybody's that. always thought that was a better right. location. I hate the idea of building, building more parking on the river. Yeah. But we've got to accommodate parking in this into downtown, even yeah. without the first interstate project. There's an abandonment. But I think the Parking Commission has made a good faith effort in exploring this option. Absolutely. I don't think we could have denied looking at this option. And I think we, we reacted to it as quickly as possible. We put money down on the table and we found out an answer. It wasn't necessarily what we had hoped for because we hoped that at this point we, were, we had a design ready to go and you know, be done in nine months. And, but it, I, and it would have been almost ridiculous to be looking at two sites at the same time that right. close together. And also, we haven't participated in many of those discussions because we felt that the First Interstate Bank was having the discussions through Mike with Herzog and with Federated. So we weren't involved in a lot of those discussions because that was taking place outside of our domain. Um, I think that 
if we did look at something that we could be quick to react to, I think we need to look at the first interstate property at the um, drive-in facility. They own it. We can partner in with that, and we could be very responsive and build something much quicker than I think negotiating for air rights with Federated. I mean, we've been having this discussion for over a year with them, and we're nowhere closer now than we were with that first phone call. So, I mean, if, if, if time is of the essence, I think we have to look at what we have in hand and what we can control, just like the Riverside lot. We owned that. We knew we could take control of that and go as quickly as possible and do the RFP and get Carl Walker on board, and we pumped through six different designs in a matter of two months. And so we found our answer. It's not feasible to build the parking structure there. Okay, now we need to look at where we can be most reactive next. And I think what we have to look at is what assets we have in our hand that we control right now. See, Anne, I, I just think that you're, that that's a decision that you're making based on control versus what is ultimately maybe the best decision. Maybe that, maybe the bank, existing bank uh, facility is the best location. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't think so, okay. nor do I think Riverfront is, but, but I think you're, you're, you're suggesting that because you control that process right now, is it the best location? I don't know. I think, yeah. I think that everybody in this yeah. room seems to think that that's the best location. If we put focus on it and we know who can start making some decisions about securing mm -hmm. leases, whether they're air leases or ground leases, somebody's got to be able to pull the trigger. Bank isn't going to pull the trigger on ground leases if the parking commission is going to build a facility there. Um, so, you know, we have, mm -hmm. we have to have somebody uh, that's going to bring us all together and we can work consistently together so we can make those decisions timely. Mm -hmm. But again, I think everybody understands that it isn't going to make, if we can't build it in that footprint right now, then mm -hmm. we've wasted our time. Um, we don't know that. It appears like we could get something done, but we need a little bit of preliminary work there. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a question and then make a suggestion based on the answer. Do you feel like your relationship with Carl Walker at this point is good enough that you could go to them and say, what would it take, well, number one, where are the breakpoints in efficiency, or if there is such a thing? We know what our width is, it's fixed, if we're talking about the federated lot. you got a street, you got a building. The length is the, is the variable. So in an ideal scenario, what would our footprint be there? <clears throat> then we know how much we're talking to the Holiday Inn about and how mm -hmm. much we're talking to um, uh, Federated about. Well, we're talking to Federated about all of theirs, but we, you know, Holiday Inn's a variable. That would give us something tangible. That's one way to approach it. That would give us something tangible. If it's 100 cars a floor and we need 400 cars, we want to build four floors of parking. You know, then we could do some, some graphics possibly with Oz or whoever, to see how that would work and sit down with Herzog and sit down with, if it takes going to Cincinnati, go to Cincinnati, I don't know. But see, I don't got think... to close this deal, but the other, you know, the other thing is to say, to approach this as, we don't want to build more than three floors of parking, so here's what we can get if we do this, or we don't want to build more than five floors of parking. We need something to, to put this in a box. Mm -hmm. You know, the just box was created on the riverfront lot. Had we even been able to do it, it was already there for us. Yeah. We don't have a box right now. The, uh, the bank drive-up facility that exists today, I mean, no one would even be able to start uh, right. anything on that until 2010 right. um, before you could even start to build it um, yeah. because they're going to have to use it up to some point in time. Yeah. The existing drive-up facility won't be done until we're moved in uh, and then we can tear down that other building, build the drive-up, then shut down. That, that, so you're looking at 2011 before mm -hmm. uh, you even be able to get into parking down there. Ellen, I uh, sit here trying to look at the big picture, and the expert tire building, there's a partnership, and they're talking retail condos. Are they talking about parking underneath that, or, or do they have an interest in our, this structure? They will definitely have an interest. Uh, and the Wilma, they do thing? have parking underneath already. It's not. They yeah. use that. <clears throat> and the Wilma, the same thing. You know, the Wilma seems less concerned about parking because they have 24 residential units there and a couple of offices, and, and everybody's been parking for years. You know, they've got their parking that they have under the bridge, and you know, we're talking to Rick and Justin about 
some other stuff they want to do and track the park again and come up in the conversation for a while. Would it be practical um, to get the parties that are interested, the Holiday Inn, Interstate Bank, Expert Tire, whoever that partnership is, and say, you know, we're trying to do this, let's have the parking commission, everybody else kick some money in, if it's $30,000, and build the model or whatever we have to do. But get the interested parties so they all have an interest in it. Uh, so hopefully there's a commitment going along because we may have to come back. I think what we're talking about is less than 10. You do? Absolutely. I mean, this, this exercise with Riverfront Lot was far more complex than anything you'd be looking at on a federal property. Because it's clean. I mean, you don't have all those constraints. And you don't have the geometry to deal with. And you don't, you know, and I don't know that if we did the thing on federated property that we would be concerned about having a top deck that's available for community events and has to handle live loads. That was a whole big complicating layer in this thing. I mean, everybody thinks, oh, it's a piece of cake, it's just people, but Ann found out firsthand there's a big difference. <laughs> complicated. Well, to if you don't mind two cents worth of fellow board members, spending, 10, spending money on these kinds of studies to me has more value to this community than spending $60,000 on some marketing program, which I don't agree with. Uh, these are the things we need to be doing. Well, I think we need to do this. I, I would argue uh, partnering with the other downtown entities as far as advertising. I think. Some of the issues and to get away from the parking structures, the educational things that we did last year with our fine structure change indicated we needed to do a better job of educating, and that's going to take marketing. However, I, I think that spending 10000 here is a wise thing. We have a limited amount of funds, and we, we're, we need to sit down at some point and figure out where we want to put our emphasis. But to be most responsive at this point, I would just go back to Oz. I mean, rather than engage Carl Walker, because that will need another contract. <laughs> and that was, if you remember, quite a lengthy process for us. Um, go back to Oz and say, formalize the work that they've already got going here. Because I, those were the directives we gave them when we had this done, what, six months ago. So. But I think, I forget who brought it up, the question of how many, uh, is there a breaking point where, right. where cost efficiency start to come in as far as the number of vehicles relative to the spaces that we need it might not be a bad idea to have somebody in. It might be us that could say, okay, if we stay on the federated lot, this is what we're going to end up with by floor. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what we'll need if we're, if we're going to do, meet the demand that, that we're talking about supposedly out there, when I hear the number 400, uh, how far, how much of the other space would we have to have in order to accomplish that? Mm -hmm. and, and I'd like to have a look at an L-shaped space, not necessarily not necessarily just going straight back. Right. Because I think I think Holiday Inn would look much more favorably if it didn't, the, well, the well, schematic isn't still up there, but if it didn't come as close to their building but wrapped around behind. Wouldn't it be, Jeff, if, if we do this, and I assume you'd be our spokesperson, wouldn't it be prudent to have Holiday Inn sitting beside you? Uh, if we're going to be talking about L's, I mean, if they uh, let them buy into this, well, so we only have one problem instead of two. I um, there's there is still some balance left on my contract with you, and I would be happy to continue working, organizing these things, and getting Oz to do this work and following up on it with them, and sitting down with the Holiday Inn. And well, you know, I, I think, I think that's right. the most expeditious. You need a point person to do this who's going yeah, to be focused right. to do it. Mm -hmm. Are they going to get confused, though, with having the bank, have been, having been the point person? I mean, is this going to... I, well, I think so. I, I really think it's important that, that you would engage us in the conversation. So, you know, mm -hmm. like you said, we need somebody to manage the process here. And we're, we're busy running a bank mm -hmm. and trying to build a building. Um, you know, yeah. everybody's got different things going on, and nobody's got well, the time and energy to sink into one it. One of the things that's part of what you're talking about is bringing the, everybody together. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And and bringing those appropriate people together at the appropriate times. Mm -hmm. In the middle, he's uh, orchestrating and organizing. 
I, I, I think that's a great idea. Can I have something from the peanut gallery? Just so everybody knows, I, I am not on commission. I'm mean, to the monthly accounting, so I come to a lot of these meetings. But um, I'm just I mean, kind of wondering. You know, you talk about hey, we're spending twenty and thirty thousand bucks a day. Um, I've been involved with this organization since about '84, and I see the stream of people coming in, asking money of the parking commission constantly. You know, just today, a hundred fifty thousand dollar ask. I mean, that that's a you know, and it, it may be very good. Would and I'm obviously not speaking for them, but would the bank be willing to throw in, you know, five thousand dollars with their ten thousand dollars and make fifteen thousand dollars to get a better study done, you know, that, that you're asking for? I mean, five thousand bucks we've already burned that up over lunch, you know, with with what you're doing there. So I, I mean, I understand that you that the bank feels that the parking commission should should provide it, and maybe the parking commission doesn't. You know, wouldn't accept that or whatever. I'm, like I said, I'm speaking out of turn, but it might be helpful or it might make them feel better. I don't know. If somebody said, "Hey, you know, we'll we'll throw in five grand on this because it is value to us." I mean, there's obviously value to you, and 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 uh, if you guys will throw in ten, and you know, I'm, I'm more. sure the bank would be amenable to to help and support in some 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 way. And I think you know we've kind of got on a limb and building the building as it yeah. is, and. and with the expectation that uh, there's going to be some reimbursements for some of the things that we've done already uh, to the downtown. So we've, we've done that and are making a significant uh, investment in downtown Missoula. Um, but I think we could be supportive of something as well. But Jeff, uh, you all agree, if, if you, could you get this organized, figure out what it's going to cost, and if we need to have a special meeting, uh, I think we should do that because of the gravity of the situation. Trying to accommodate, and I, I don't argue that we, we need to get some concrete trucks over here and some steel beams. No, I don't argue, never have. It's just, we, we're dealing with an entity that doesn't like the top. And, uh, uh, but Jeff, if, if you feel comfortable with that, and if, if we need to get together to approve the funding, uh, if we have a specific amount, then if you could, it would really be great if you could kick in, that helps. Uh, it's only our bonding level that hurts every time our account goes down. So uh, I'm trying to keep that into focus. Uh, you you want to look into that and, sure. and, and then report back to Ann and then you can email us and, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't have to have a full blown meeting. We just get together. Uh, we'd have to do a public uh, advertisement, but mm -hmm. how many days in advance? 48 hours. So, yeah, we could do that. Uh, so, can we put the ball in your court? Sure, I'll take a look at it. Thank you, Jim. Any other thoughts, comments? I'd like to just thank everybody on the Parking Commission for your diligence and patience. We all become alcoholics by the end of this or jump off the bridge. Am I not already? Thank you. Yeah, he, he emailed me yesterday. Said that he told him he hadn't seen for a while. He said, Well, I come down here once in a while and stand and look down into the pit. And I emailed him back, Don't jump. <laughs> well, it'll be a few years down the road, and we'll, uh, I don't know if we'll all be in a room together meeting, but we'll know that there's some good work that happened, and the result of it will be obvious. So, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll all have our next meeting date, uh, barring Jeff. Is March 27th. Uh, with that, I'll adjourn the meeting.